Ladies and gentlemen, this is the BU Hockey Show. Makes a one-timer down low for Cockrell in front. Curry scores! BU moving it well, and a shot and a goal. Mueller deeks, saved by Schroeder. Got an opportunity for a shot, and she scores. Welcome into episode 14 of the BU Hockey Show. As always, I'm Patrick Donnelly. With me, as always, is Brady Doc Gardner. How are we today? <laughs> Good as always, I, Patrick. You, I, you walked right into that one. That was easy. I know, and I forgot how to talk again, like last episode. Um, You're but excited. here we are. Excited. I'm excited. Excited because we have a special guest today joining us is Hockey East Associate Commissioner Brian Smith. How are you today, Brian? Doing well, guys. Thanks for having me on. So yeah. Brian reached out to us earlier this week, actually while we were recording the last show. Um, because Brady has been doing God's work for the BU <laughs> Hockey me. Show, <laughs> trying did. to trying to decipher the Hockey East scheduling process, I suppose. And Brian told us, "Hey, you guys are close, but hey, figured rather than let speculation run rampant, get let, let you guys know what's going on." So well, this is almost making it boring, though, you know, because I've enjoyed trying to like piece it together in my own way, and now we're just gonna get the answers, I guess. It's like it's ruining the fun a little bit. No, it's good to hear, and I, I'm sure there. You know, I'm not the only one out there who's been really interested in how the schedule has come together. And so finally, you know, if we can get some answers to that, I'm sure the people at home will really appreciate it. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a it's a difficult process, but you guys have been doing a pretty good job of, of keeping up with it. Um, so, yeah, happy to happy to talk about it. So you said you create the schedule, right? Yeah. So I've been involved with the schedule um, the last several years, including when, when Joe is commissioner. Um, and I was set to take a, an increased role this year and that's, you know, been tenfold at this point because we, we, we had a schedule obviously, and then we scrapped it over the summer, um, because we needed to adjust to the new reality. So, um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the main, uh, schedule maker, I guess, at this point, um, on a weekly basis, uh, and, and I'll continue to do that, um, you know, as, as the years go on and, and get into a regular rhythm. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, this year, obviously, like you said, it's just so weird, you know, and so much more difficult. I assume it's more than just you. Like if you're, you're the one putting the pairings together, let's say, there's probably a pretty strong committee that approves everything, I would think, right? Yeah, so the, the way it's worked is um, the league has jurisdiction over league games, obviously. Uh, and so at this point where every game is a league game, um, we're pairing them up uh, as best we can just based off of who needs to play who and uh, who's available obviously those are the two big things so um yeah we it, on a typical week i'll set a schedule between tuesday and thursday uh for what works with all these different components that we have to take into consideration i'll sit down with steve tomorrow and we'll fine tune it um and then when we fine tune it we essentially create uh two or three different parallel tracks that we could go down based on uh all sorts of things that can come up so we will create a few of those and then we'll vet it with um, administrators at each school uh, to make sure it clears a certain number of checkpoints, including testing protocols and facility availability and all these things. And then, um, you know, Saturday sometime over the weekend, we'll say, hey, here's what we're thinking. Uh, Sunday, start to lock things in and then Monday, finalize everything, get the TV details locked up and then three o'clock on Tuesday release it that's the, that's right that's become a, the time the, of the week the tuesday selection show exactly. <laughs> interesting so you're already working on next week you know basically not as we speak but you know whenever right now yeah exactly so i actually it's been a little bit easier the last couple of weeks because we, there's only so many pairings left mm. uh and really the priority for us is to find as many new matchups as we can even if it's one-off games at this point during the week um and that'll come into play a little bit later when we get into uh, playoff selections. So I've already mapped out um, at least the men's schedule, I think for next week uh, and partially the women's schedule. And we'll drill down into it a little bit more tomorrow with Steve uh, to fine tune it and, and find the spots that actually work, giving all the other constraints that we typically work with. Yeah. Interesting. Patrick, I don't, I don't want to like just, you know, hog it here. If you had any thoughts, no, no, I know this is your your baby, so I was gonna let you you I was gonna let you run wild. I appreciate um, that because we had this questions list and pretty much everything <laughs> was Brady. Um, but Just I guess like thoughts. you know, I, I reached out to you on Twitter in the fall, Brian, um, when the league was kind of like games felt like they were dropping like flies, and I was so I was just wondering like what was that like trying to adjust to everything, especially in the early going where so many things were changing so so quickly. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think when that started happening, we were, or at least I was a little bit more sensitive to the public perception of it. Um, but if people didn't know the inner workings of it all, it probably seemed a little bit more panicked than it actually was. Okay. Um, so we had, we sat down over the summer and created a path to playing the season. Um, that included everything that you're seeing happening. So the, the protocol, um, the scheduling uh, decisions, the testing, everything officials availability everything so when we got to a point where we announced the composite schedule which had been you know months of work at that time um including the flex weekends uh including everything else we realized that pretty quickly after that when maine went on pause vermont went on pause northeastern went on pause that it was filling up our flex weekends pretty quickly uh and until maybe a month ago there was still a path to playing a schedule that looks relatively balanced uh, and complete uh, with playing out the rest of that schedule with different flex dates swapped in. Um, at a certain point, it started to lose that. But as we were kind of navigating those initial parts, we felt pretty good about it because when we lost a series, we plugged it into one of those flex weekends. We just shifted things around. We never ended up announcing any of those, obviously. Um, but we had enough time and enough games to settle all those uh postponed games in uh including for vermont which who took the longest la so it, it wasn't so much uh concern on our end rather than just kind of reshuffling the cards and putting them back in the deck uh until at that point where it kind of broke down where we started just having too many repeat opponents and this was also happening concurrently with our discussions about the playoffs um and variety of opponent is important for a number of reasons um, the, the, not the least of which is, is because if we're not playing an even amount of games and, uh, we can't do a points based seating system, uh, if somebody played the bottom three teams in the league a million times and someone else played the top three teams, that has to be accounted for somehow. So in the beginning, it was smooth sailing. We were just you know, marching forward. We were, we weren't playing very many games, but we had rescheduled all of them for a later date. Um, so it was a little bit disappointing in the beginning because we had put so much work into the schedule, but really what the schedule was built on was the protocols. And we've fallen back on the protocols numerous times already. Uh, and it's really proved to be a solid foundation that allows us not to panic too much because we've set out all these different contingencies um, for when they happen and, and they have happened. And at this point, we feel pretty good about anything that we're going to face now. So in the beginning, it was a little bit disappointing more than anything else, just because so much work had kind of fallen to the wayside. But um, the RTP document that we built was really the, the cornerstone for everything else. So um, the schedule just became fluid and everyone's been great. Um, you know, coaches, administrators, <laughs> facility people, uh, everybody with, with rearranging as we need to. Yeah, and it is crazy, you know, you look all the way back to the original plan released back in November and just how much has changed since then, you know, flex games feel like they were a year ago, rather than, you know, just a month or so. Uh, but it's interesting, you kind of piecing away, or I guess, you know, pulling away different parts of it, you know, oh, no more flex games anymore. And now just a couple of weeks ago, no more long term schedule, it's just going to be week by week, which is totally, you know, unprecedented, but so are these times. So it's all, it all makes sense. Um, you know, what was kind of what put you over the edge, though, when it, it became it's unrealistic to try to keep, you know, going off this original schedule as we have been for, you know, whatever it was at that point, you know, we better just start doing this week by week, like what decided that? Yeah, so we had, um, we'd gotten to the point where we were doing this anyway, we, you know, we were still sitting down and saying, okay, we lost X, Y, and Z game, how do we accommodate it? And, and I had kept, you know, these master spreadsheets, um, tracking all these changes and word documents and, and we would use them together. Um, so it got to a point where, as I said, maybe a month or so ago, just before we had announced it, maybe a week before we announced it, it became pretty clear that um, if we played out the schedule as it was, we were going to run into repeats for guys like Boston College and UMass really quickly. Uh, so they'd be repeating opponents when other teams uh, were significantly lagging in opponents. And uh, I think there was a situation where BC was going to play Merrimack uh, and then their opponent the weekend before got lost and Merrimack was the one available. So they would have ended up playing four times in a row. And we we're like, okay, well, you know, let's just scrap this because if we do get rid of it and up until that point, we had been keeping 
as many originally scheduled games as possible. Because as I said, if we, for, until a certain point, if we played all those games, we were going to be in a really good spot at the end. Maybe UMass isn't playing the 28 games that they originally were scheduled for, um, but they're playing 25 and the variety of opponents is about the same. So we got to a point where that just wasn't going to be the case anymore because of these redundant games, including the ones that were rescheduled into those flex weekends. And we said, let's loosen the constraints of trying to schedule around, uh, you know, any team's already set opponent, uh, which we didn't really want to do because there's facility availabilities, which is a huge issue that uh, probably doesn't get enough attention, but it's, it's a massive piece to the, to our puzzle. And um, you know, cancel the buses, cancel everything, and we'll just go week to week because we'll be able to get that variety of opponents. Um, and as we start to move to midweek games, play as many of those as we can because we're not going to be worried about BU playing Northeastern on a Tuesday if they're scheduled to play the next weekend. Uh, so we're essentially scheduling about 10 days out now, 10 to 14 days maybe, um, to include those midweek games. But it was at the point where we had so many redundancies in the schedule that it was just easier to loosen the constraints and kind of free ourselves of any expectation. Um, and it's, it's paid off because it's been, it's been a little bit easier. And uh, like I said, everyone's been great in adjusting and moving to it. Yeah, it, it is, you know, a testament, I guess, to the flexibility of everyone. It seems you mentioned the facilities and that's something you barely even think about. It's like, Oh, the hockey arena, it just must be empty, right? Like you can use it any time. And no, you can't. So, you know, between that and like you said, buses, hotels for teams when you need them, um, you know, teams going on and off of COVID protocols, uh, just getting the unique matchups. Like that's five things off my head. And I don't know, probably, you know, half of more than that, of, you know, what, what else there is. What other, if you can say like considerations go into picking a specific matchup on any given weekend? Yeah. So I think that's the tricky part, right? Because you got to start with who's healthy and who's available. Um, how many games have they played recently in terms of, you know, that 10 day period or whatever, because if you're doing a, a situation where you're playing eight games and, you know, however many days, it's, it's just not a great experience for the athletes, which is really why we're doing this. Um, so what we do is we sit down, who's healthy, who's available. Um, what does travel look like? Who hasn't played who, um, and then go from there. So from there, we then drill into, is your facility available? So especially for um, schools that play basketball in the same arena. So think about BC, think about UMass. Uh, sometimes they can't play because they have basketball commitments and we're trying we're all in this together, right? So basketball is trying to do the same things we're doing. So if they're playing basketball, we obviously can't play hockey. Um, so we take that into consideration. And then as we do that, we also have to pair off the men's and women's um, men's and women's teams because for this year a lot of schools most schools maybe one or two actually are the only ones that that are can do it but most schools can't have double headers uh, because of locker room space and because of the amount of cleaning that would have to be done and the time in between and then the staffing constraints that go on top of that so we have to then put the pieces of the puzzle together between the men's league and the women's league using the availability based on everything else uh, between staffing between uh, and even if it's not in that arena, how many other games are going on that day that you can commit your staff to the hockey game versus the other, uh, the other games. So all these things come into play and then we sit down and say, okay, this is what makes sense here. Who hasn't played who here's who can play on a weekday game. Um, you know, Maine, Vermont, much harder to play a, a random Tuesday, Wednesday game than BC and BU. Uh, and then we look out. So having that ability to look, 10 days into the future and plan around that uh, is, is huge. Um, and then on top of all that too, we're also trying to keep as much of a home away balance as possible, except for Maine currently. Um, so if we're able to do that, it's, it's really going to be, it's slim pickings for who can play who and on what day. And then all that, we have to stay inside the protocol. So we have to stay inside the testing protocol. We have to stay inside uh, our officials availability. So those are just some of the things that, that kind of come into play. I'm sure there's more that pop up on a one-off basis, but those are the things that we basically have to check off every single time we put a matchup together because any one of those could just be, uh, you know, a non-starter and, and kind of stop us in our tracks. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I, I noticed so you, you were talking about um, when you decided to go week by week with things um, where all the challenges just put you to that point. Was there ever a point you know before the season or i know in the 
ball, you, it seemed a little bit more panicky on the outside than it was internally. Um, but was there ever a point where the league considered shutting things down and not playing or and slash what would it take to get to that point? Yeah. So there, there was never a point where we had those conversations. Um, you know, I remember thinking back to last year, right after the women's championship, where we had a lot of phone calls with the ADs about canceling the men's tournament. Um, <clears throat> so we had a pretty good basis of what it would take to have those conversations and certainly not afraid to get into that. But we spent so much time, as I said, creating this uh, return to play document and the protocols and the testing and very specific guidelines and mandates um, that, it was going to take care of a lot of these issues as they popped up as long as we adhered to them as, as strictly as possible. And we have pretty strict standards, um, which a lot of games have been lost because of how strict the standards are and not necessarily any uncontrolled spread. So when we look at, you know, the second part of your question there, what would it take? It's kind of hard to say. Um, you know, we were aware of the situation of, well, what if one, one school can't go or another school can't go and you see what other leagues have done. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, we're doing everything in the best interest of all of our members. And that's our responsibility from a league office where the membership really makes a lot of the policies and the decisions. And then we carry that out. So uh, had we gotten to a point where we had really discussed that? No, because we had gotten uh, so far into the RTP that it was um, amenable to everybody. Everybody was able to adhere to it. Uh, the amount of testing that they do um, everyone was comfortable with the officiating standards. Uh, and, and this is all like kind of in our own internal, um, network, obviously just with the league. So, um, we, we never really got to that point. Um, maybe some difficult moments that where it gets frustrating and really difficult, but that's our job to figure that out. So we, we, we've worked through a few bumpy patches, um, you know, the scheduling included, um, and, and last minute changes, but everybody's been bought in. Everyone's been flexible with it. So it's been a really uh, good experience, I think, for us internally because of that communication that's taken place, because of that understanding that we have. Uh, and there, there hasn't really been much of a normal partisan, you know, rivalry. We want to beat you into the dirt every single game that you might see in a normal year because everyone's just trying to do their best to play. So, um, you know, pauses are pauses uh, and, and necessary uh, at some times and everybody understands that. So uh, we have, you know, contingencies in place if things are to, to go further south um, than they have to this point. But I don't, there really hasn't been those conversations because the focus is on how do we stay healthy? How do we stay safe? How do we continue moving forward? Which has been, uh, you know, a credit to, to the membership to keep doing that and over the summer having created such a strong document to, to get us this far in the first place. Yeah. Kind of along the lines too, of the early planning of all this. Uh, it's interesting. You know, one of the only things that is still the same is no interleague play. You know, it's always been, we're going to play within hockey East and that's still what's happening. And that's kind of become the norm across college sports. Really. We're even seeing it in the NHL right now, you know, with them just going with their divisions and you play within them, it's become what's happening really across sports this year. Um, but there's been the idea of, oh, there's only four ECA team teams playing. How hard is it to get those within the Hockey East program? Or, you know, maybe Atlantic Hockey also being in the Northeast. Maybe the travel's easy for that. Was there any consideration at any point in adding in some matchups against ECAC or Atlantic Hockey or whoever it might have been? Yeah, Beyond, so we, like right at the start? We were, yeah, we were in, in contact with, with the different leagues throughout the whole process, really. And, um, were aware of what they were doing and where they were trending and where we were trending and, and what our preferred route was going to be uh, from a membership standpoint, right? So uh, like you said, we were able to control what we can control. Uh, and, and through these conversations, um, not everybody is on the same page in terms of different leagues, right? So not everyone is doing the same thing. And Hockey East felt comfortable with what Hockey East was putting forward and no less. And so like I mentioned, there have been games lost because of how strict the protocol is. And not necessarily anything that uh, is harmful or, or that, that might, people might think that, oh, the, a team is getting a bunch of COVID-19 outbreaks. I think a perfect example is the BU UMass series, which was uh, not played as scheduled because we needed to go through our proper pro protocol and clear it. And if we couldn't clear it, then we weren't going to play the games. But it just took us a couple of extra days to get there. Um, so that was kind of where our comfort level was. Uh, and a big piece of it too, was we build this strategy and this idea and we put out the schedule and obviously with 11 teams, 
uh, at least on the men's side, someone isn't going to be playing every week. But one of my initial thoughts when we were creating it was uh, this is actually better for us because we'll always have somebody on standby and we've needed that standby team more often than not. I think maybe there's been one weekend where uh, a team has sat when they were fully healthy and ready to go. So that flexibility was important to us. Um, and it wasn't so much, we're not going to play non-conference teams, but we need to take care of our own house as much as possible. Because I think the worst thing that could have happened would be if we left one of our own teams hanging when we didn't need to. Um, and so, like I said, we've been able to fill those spots uh, pretty much every single time they've come up, maybe except for once, but that's a, a good problem to have because that means everybody's healthy and playing. Um, so we, we stay in touch. Uh, like we're very close with the ECAC folks. We talk to the Atlantic guys all the time. Um, and it's, it's a situation where we're all trying to help each other get through this as quickly as possible in the safest way that we see possible. And so logistically for us, playing within our league was really the thing that made sense. In short, things may pop up once or twice, but um, it's just a year where we got to prioritize doing everything that's right for Hockey East. And to everyone's credit, we bought into that fully. Uh, and, and at this point too, we're playing midweek games. Uh, one of our things too is there's really just not going to be the opportunities or enough time because we can't risk taking away games from our own opponents. And you're seeing that now ish with uh, BU, UMass Lowell, who have a low number of games on the men's side. Um, and we need to hit the minimum, right? We need to get to the NCAA minimum of 13. So playing those midweek games is going to be crucial. And the timing of how we're testing, of who we're testing, of when the games are played is all under our control. And that was really the driving factor and has been. Yeah. You talk about midweek games. Like it seems like it's been kind of on an as needed basis, like that BU UMass series being pushed to Sunday, Monday uh, and other games, you know, like right now with uh, actually no, the BU women are still going to be playing on Friday, but Merrimack has a game on Tuesday, right. Against mm -hmm. Vermont. It seems like that's been as needed but is there a chance that we're going to see more midweek games scheduled just for what you said, you know, BU, UMass Lowell, whoever else it might be needing to get games in. Will there be, they be playing, you know, weekend and then maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere there. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's part of the whole process too, right? We can control all that. So we can play a weekend game. We can play Tuesday. You can play that next weekend. And then you don't play the next week, but you're on the next weekend. Uh, so there's a cadence and there's a pattern to it. And it was important for us and for our medical group in the beginning that we were able to set a cadence and play weekend games before we started looking at midweek games, because it's a, it's an infinitely more complex scenario now, especially when you get into different um, interstate travel restrictions, uh, you know, government protocols, uh, renting buses that you might need to, to get a whole team down to a certain um, arena. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that come into play there. But now that we're in that pattern, we've kind of established ourselves that we're able to do it and demonstrated that we're able to do it. Uh, the goal is to increase that. Um, not the least reason of which is, is to make sure that we get those minimums, um, but it's also easier. because So if, if BC and BU can play, uh, well, that's a bad example of playing this weekend, but if B, BU and Northeastern can play on a Tuesday, then that eliminates a weekend series that we can use to play Maine or Vermont. So it's all kind of a, a piece together. And UMass is sitting this weekend. Um, they're playing on Tuesday. They'll play next weekend. They'll probably play, uh, you know, another midweek game somewhere in there too. Um, but again, that is also a decision that's driven by facility availability, being able to play in the Mullen Center. So it all comes into play where if, for whatever reason, the team has to sit on a weekend, we have a cadence and a structure in place where you can play two midweek games and you're not netting a loss of any games at all. You're just shifting around where they're played and how they're played. Interesting. Yeah. And I know you mentioned, you know, getting to the NCAA minimum of 13 um, and midweek games definitely help that, but would you consider moving the, or extending, I guess, the regular season past the first week of March to get those games in before the league playoffs? Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. And, and the reason why we've structured our season the way we've structured it is because the NCAA has not moved their selection um, days. So both for the men and the women, the, the tournaments have to be over by their selection day. The latest you could play is you know, noon or whatever on selection day, which is the Sunday following our tournament. So March, whatever it is, March 7th and, and 21st. Um, so those are the, those dates are set in stone and we can't play after that. 
So we have to work backwards and figure out how we can play a tournament with every team um, in it as much as possible. And this is another reason why week to week scheduling has helped us because it gives us uh, the freedom to move things around as we need to accommodate the tournament with an all comers tournament. So we didn't, we, we talked about it in the beginning of the year uh, over the summer uh, saying, Hey, you know, if the NCAA could delay because there's a delayed start, you know, we're looking at November start instead. This is how early those conversations were. Um, it'd be great if we could then shift everything and, and play later. And, and maybe the, you know, the frozen four or whatever is in whenever June and you need to play a normal schedule. But when the NCAA decided not to move the tournament, that impacts our decision to not move our championship because we can't, because we need that AQ uh, and play it that way. So we could have, I guess, technically not played a tournament and given the AQ to the regular season champion. Um, but really our goal from the start has been, we want to be able to give out two hockey East trophies. And that is a huge success in our eyes, uh, or I guess four hockey East trophies. So we give out two regular season champions, two tournament champions, we have done everything we can to give as much of a normal experience for this season as possible to all of our players. Um, so we did talk about it. It would have been, uh, you know, certainly a, a, a release for um, the, the time constraints, but we're, we're locked into that. So we're working backwards from that essentially at this point. Yeah, I have plenty of playoff questions for sure. Um, but I do want to kind of circle back with the regular season. And you mentioned the, the BUBC series coming up this weekend. Uh, and I did a little bit of, you know, researching how, how could that have happened? You know, that we're getting BUBC now. Uh, and so I saw, you know, BC has X amount of teams left to play. It's a fairly low number because they've played plenty of games, right? And they have, you know, Maine and UVM who are both on pause. And then they have UConn who still needs to play against only one other team. So you paired them up. And that kind of checks off that, you know, unique matchups that you say is a priority, understandably. Uh, but then I notice it comes down to, uh, I think it's BU, BC, UMass Lowell, UNH, um, where you paired up BU and BC and you paired up UNH and UMass Lowell, but you also could have swapped some of those in there. And I don't, there's probably those, you know, like secondary reasoning, whether it's facilities and stuff. But if it comes down to, a judgment call if let's say everything is even and you had those four teams to work with how do you decide you know we want to pair this team and that team like if it's down to just your decision how do you make that decision yeah uh so that's when it's doesn't not, ever come down to that <laughs> yeah it, it's not enviable to be in those positions but as i kind of explained in the beginning so tomorrow when i'll sit down with steve we map out the schedule and then we'll create parallel tracks and we'll say, okay, this is a possibility, like you said, or they could play Lowell or UNH or whoever. And, and this is who would be sitting out in this scenario. This is who would be available. It, this matchup might be a repeat, but we could, you know, move it around and do this. So we, we usually end up with probably three on average different potential matchups for just that weekend block. So what we do then is we then take, uh, midweek games in consideration too. So like if BU and Northeastern can play in the midweek and that was one of the options, we'll just remove that option and say, okay, this is better suited here. And then what we'll do is we'll then play out each different track the next weekend. So if this team is here, uh, uh, then they can go here next and then we can match up this. And if we end up one way with a combination where we can have four unique matchups or five unique matchups on the men's side, and then four or five or three or two or three or five based on billing availability and all those things that we talked about, we pick the one that gives us the highest percentage of new matchups in both weeks. Um, so at some point uh, like Maine and, and UMass only has to play Maine now at this point. So they're going to hit that uh, and then play somebody else. So they're their next matchup, right? That, that, that's the logical thing. And especially because uh, UMass doesn't have a women's program, they can just play there. Mm -hmm. So that's easy. And then having those blocks filled. So having your spreadsheet completely filled in uh, as much as possible. Like it's like a bingo card, right? So we fill that and we feel good about it. And the one thing that is different on my uh, files than your files, Brady, is that I also want to know when they played, right? When they played and where they played. So I'm able to track that and may, now UMass will play Maine and then hopefully an opponent that they played in November. Um, so we look at it that way and we, we draw it out, you know, another week, another weekend and see which gives us the best chance to have the most unique matchups as opposed to working in a vacuum where it's just this weekend. 
Because if it's just this weekend, you can kind of trick yourself into making a lot of easier decisions that actually complicate your, your life down the road. Uh, and it's, there's infinite permutations because we're also doing this for the men's and the women's league at the same time. So it's like a, one of those 18 sided Rubik's cubes that you see. Um, but it's, that's how we do it. That's how we pick. Sometimes it comes down to a judgment. And if there is a judgment, there's been times where we've paired up teams that have just come off of a pause with a team that also just came off of a pause. Uh, even if it's not the most logistically sound, because from a competitive standpoint, it's better that way and it's safer that way. Uh, and that will continue to happen, I'm sure. Uh, but we have done that in the past and it, it's all about who's played who, how recently have you played? And then all those factors that we talked about. Yeah. So the, it's never, you know, on the outside, it seems like, oh, let's get BUBC in while we can. But it's really a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's, it's it's a lot more than that. And and I had my first go around for this weekend was was pretty significantly different than what we ended up with, but that's why we kind of pick through and, and dig it down because you, you look at who's available and, and who can play and who wants to play a midweek game and, and what it looks like. So um, it's a, it's always more complicated than it looks. And then I also think about my, my friends, the SIDs and, and making Kevin Edelson redo his notes completely again um, that I know it takes so much time and uh, not that that ever really goes into it, but it crosses my mind, you know, as I'm changing yeah. things. So um, it's been, it, it's usually more complicated than it, mm -hmm. than it seems. Nice. Uh, and then also along that, you know, that big matchup thing, uh, we have BU and BC on uh, Nesson Plus this weekend. And so that leads to maybe just spelling the myth or putting something into it. Does Nesson have any say, you know, we really want this matchup this weekend because, oh, the Bruins aren't playing on Saturday. We better have a good game on Saturday. Does that happen? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, that doesn't happen necessarily that way. Um, it, it wouldn't typically happen that way in a normal year necessarily, but they would have some input um, just in terms of time slots and things like that. So um, if you back up the timeline, so Steve and I sit down Thursday, we talk about it over the weekend, we sit down Monday and hammer through it. Uh, I will send Ness in a rough draft of, hey, this is what we're looking at. And then I'll have like 15 phone calls with Nesson going back and forth. Can we shift this half an hour? Can we move this up? Is there any interest in producing this game? Um, at least for this year is how we've approached it. So we've been able to do it that way. Uh, certainly prioritizing big matchups. Uh, if BC is playing BU on either gender, if UNH is playing Maine, uh, if Northeastern is playing BC on the women's side, something like that, where you have these just high profile, really extraordinary players where there's a certain storyline um, as we're going through making the schedule on Sunday or Monday, I'll say it would be great if we could get, you know, Aaron Frankel playing on prime time and fr on Friday night, because she has a chance to break the, the hockey East all time shutouts record. Um, so that kind of massaging goes into it, but in terms of Nesson saying, Oh, it would be great if BC could play BU this weekend. That doesn't necessarily happen. Um, because it just can't logistically, it can't in a normal year, we might, toss some ideas around and say, well, if, you know, if there's a non-conference game this weekend, if we can shift things around, there's a little bit more flexibility, but we're also doing that in July and August. Right. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, they don't have as much influence, especially no one's got any influence this year. We're just, you know, kind of doing the best we can. Uh, but we do have those conversations on Monday and it, it more affects times, uh, start times and, um, you know, potentially a day or two, depending on what the availability looks like. Right. Okay. Uh, I know Patrick had some ideas on, on the playoffs, so I'm happy to get into playoffs because there, there's a lot of t talking points around that too, for sure. Yes. So um, I know Brady's been doing his best to keep up with uh, points percentage, although it's a little wonky with, you know, three point games, <laughs> well, two points. And... Can we throw that in? Why points percentage versus mm -hmm. winning percentage? Why do we do points percentage? Yeah, because points percentage is the amount of available points because it's not binary, right? It's not you win or you get nothing. You, you could, there's a middle ground. Um, so it's how many available points, uh, there have been. So how many games you've played times three, and then, uh, the number that you divide that by is how many points you've actually earned to get points percentage. So it's, it's, a uh, it's like a rough ratio of how successful you've been because the, the, it, it's helpful. If you think of it, the goal of a hockey game is to win in 60 minutes. If you go to overtime, you haven't really accomplished the goal. Um, but if you get to overtime, you get something and that's kind of the thought process behind going to the three point system with three on three overtime. If you ask a coach, they're going to tell you that three on three isn't hockey. It's not 
most of them will probably say that, right? And so it takes us a while to get to a point and the NCAA changes numbers and uh, how the RPI is calculated and things like that. So it was all tied into the same conversation. Okay. Um, so points percentage is a reflection of that. Now now we've moved away from you get 100% or nothing. There's kind of an in-between. Um, and so that's where you, when you get the two, you get the one. It's right. better to do a points percentage than winning percentage. Yeah, I guess that's kind of new. Well, not, not necessarily new this year because you can't have ties now um, with the shootout and everything. But it's just something I've noticed trying to piece together, you know, when teams aren't playing the same number of games every single week, you know, how can you differentiate them or line them up? Uh, that's just something that's crossed my mind. Sorry, Patrick. Yeah, well, I guess leading us into this um, is point is how are you guys going to decide the playoff seating? Is it going to be points percentage or <laughs> Is there yeah, a, is there <laughs> so I, I can't I can't get that. too deep into it yet. Um, yeah. it, it's probably not going to be points percentage. Okay. It, it, it's probably not going to be points percentage and not not winning percentage. And the reasoning for that is because, in in my opinion, it's a, a flawed way to seed teams anyway. Um, because as I and especially this season, because as I said, you could play the bottom three teams uh, and win them all. So say you know maybe B U and B C they're five and six in the standings, right? And mm-hmm. and they're separated by a little bit uh they win out both of them win out but bc beats uh the bottom three opponents and bu beats the top three in the standings so they're they're separated and and they went out um so the team that's below you can't jump them in winning percentage it stays the same uh even though you beat much tougher competition and you don't fall because you beat weaker competition so it's somewhat flawed because you're playing different strengths of schedules uh, because it's not a balanced schedule, right? It's, it's just not going to be. Um, and it's not a situation where we're going to have equal amount of games. So never mind playing everybody. Uh, you look at Merrimack's schedule in the beginning, they played ranked opponents for like their first eight, 10 games. Um, so that's a, a much different schedule than some of the other uh, teams had. And that's part of its luck of the draw. Part of it is how we drew up the schedule um, and, and then how things kind of fell. So when you're looking at something where you're getting rid of the double round Robin, which was, that was balanced and we can do points and we can seed it that way. um, It's easier to then look at other ways to do it. And so points percentage is the kind of the natural, well, you know, this is obvious, but we feel that there's something more sophisticated that we can do to account for all these different things. And we're working on doing that now. So we actually have a meeting tomorrow to go over it. Um, you know, how we're going to finesse uh, the seating. Uh, if all things go well, we'll go that direction. So it, it's possible that it may be points percentage, but I, I don't think it's likely that it's going to be because it's, we're trying to encapsulate the entirety of the season and all these nuances that come with it rather than just you beat, you know, you accumulated these, the, these many points when you look at it, if you're, if you're only playing six games, you can get 500 points and, it's just, it, it, does, it doesn't equate across the board with, with how different things are. I got to find a way to get into that meeting because now you're going to have me doing <laughs> things, trying to figure out strength of schedule. and oh, That's too much math for me there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think it's, here's, the, here's the easiest way to think about it, right? So Maine hasn't played a single home game. Is their schedule the same as somebody that's played a 50-50 home roads play? Right. Probably not. It's, especially when you're Maine, it's, it's much more difficult to win on the road uh, than it would be at home. So those are the kinds of things uh, that's kind of the big red flag right away, right? Mm-hmm. Points percentage isn't necessarily indicative of the season that you've had. So we're working on something that's a little bit more sophisticated than that. Yeah, I don't even know how you would put like a number on that though, you know, and try and I guess it comes down to mathematically sorting out the teams. Maybe it, it's even beyond that. I don't know. That, that's yeah, it'll be, there. yeah, it'll, <laughs> I can't say too much on it right now, but it'll be, um, it, it's a lot of math. Uh, but it, it'll be a pretty cool, I think, Brady, for you. I think you'll enjoy digging oh, through will. some of the some of the the equations and things like that that might come out of it. I mean, we're inside of a month for the women's playoffs, so I'd assume we'd hear more about that soon. Yeah, and it's one of those things where I would have loved to have been able to get this out uh, earlier because it's always better when you know what you're playing for. Um, when it ultimately comes down, you know, hopefully within a week here, we'll have more information on it. Um, it's not going to have mattered if you knew about it, you know, beforehand, because it's just going to be pretty objective, uh, ideally. So it's sooner rather than later, certainly, but it's just a matter of how often we're able to communicate and meet with the membership and bring all the ADs together. So, um, it's, it's on track to be hopefully within a week an announcement about what the format is and, and, and how the seating is going to work. So, um, 
hopefully, you know, before too long, you'll be able to talk about that on the next episode. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Patrick, you had something? Oh, no. Well, as far as timing goes, it'd be perfect because we always record after the Tuesday releases. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, if you can plan all that around when we record, that'd be really awesome, please. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do what I can. Thank you. Um, you. You say, you know, getting some, but or getting something for everybody to play for. And you've already kind of done that by having the playoffs be with all the teams. So even if they're currently in the basement right now, well, they'll still have a shot at the playoffs. Um, that's tricky though, because you have 10 teams on the women's side. So, you know, it's going to be five matchups potentially in the first round leading into five teams coming out. Of, like then you have a buy somewhere in the middle. I don't know. And then the men's team's even worse almost with 11 teams. Have you thought about, and can you share how those brackets might look yeah so a 10 team tournament is definitely difficult um that's for sure and i don't think i really realized that until i tried to do it and i was like oh that's that's hard um so i guess starting on the men's side uh you can kind of see a path to what we're going to be doing if you look at the last time we had 11 teams in the tournament um so one through five had a bye and we we knew four was going to play five in the quarterfinals and then you pare it down otherwise um now, do I think there's going to be best of three series? No, I, I don't think Please that's realistic. Don't. <laughs> uh, there's not really that much time, to be quite honest with you, if we're playing everybody. So, um, you know, filling in the blanks, we're looking at a situation where we're probably still going to have a two-week tournament. Um, and it's going to be that similar format where one through five have the bye. Four is definitely playing five. And then we just need to figure out who the other three opponents are. So we'll play that. And obviously, I think the thing that's different about um, – the tournament is we're going to, you're going to ostensibly, you know, in a normal year, you'd be playing a different team on the next day. You can't do that. So we're going to have to space this out a little bit longer, uh, a little bit differently. Um, But if you're only playing one game, then it's going to be pretty easy to uh, figure that out uh, as as you go through and you in that time constraint that you have. So that's how it's going to look on the, on the men's side, the women's side is going to look very similar. Um, So it's not going to be, you know, the bracket will, will reseed, uh, as we normally do in, in a regular tournament and then kind of take it from there, play the, play the championship uh, on the normal championship day. And then, uh, you know, just like I said, we build back from the NCAA selection. So that's how it's going to look uh, ultimately when, when we nail all the final minute details down. Mm-hmm. It's just, it seems like tricky with the timing though, because you have the NCAA selection and then you have your regular season and then somewhere in between you have to run a tournament and find a champion. And so what if a team pops up with COVID cases somewhere in the middle of it, can you back up their games or is it just disqualification? Sorry, you're out. Yeah. So I think that's like the, that's the interesting question for me. Certainly I've spent a lot of time thinking about it just from a personal standpoint, you know, from a, uh, you know, as a former student athlete, like thinking about how that would go down in the logistics of it all, um, and I kind of keep going back to the, the goal is to hand out the trophy at the end. Right. And, and, and we want everyone to have a chance at doing that. Um, so working with the NCAA to, to try to keep things consistent and, and, and make sure it happens. We know that we are locked into a finite amount of time, like you said, and we're working backwards from it. So the games either have to be played or someone has to advance uh, on those days. Uh, or within a 24 hour window after those days. Um, so they're probably, it, it's probably not going to look like a, a normal tournament is going to look uh, for a number of reasons, but I can't even begin to speculate on what those might be because I, I it's so unfamiliar to me too. Um, but essentially what we'll do is we will have, and we have to this point, there's a, a games committee, a centralized games committee that hears, uh, you know, any kind of not grievances, that's not really the, the right word, but, um, you know, works through any issues that might pop up to make it as fair and equitable for everybody as possible. And, and I don't expect that to, to go away anytime soon, especially for the playoffs. So it's definitely going to be different. Um, we want everyone to play as much as possible, but it, it, it may, it may not be the case at this point, we have, uh, you know, a system in place where you essentially attest that there's X amount of players available. They've all had three negative tests. Here's everyone in my our tier one group. Um, and it's game on when all those boxes are checked it's gonna have to be the same thing for the playoffs um but maybe a condensed timeline and if a team isn't ready to go it might just be there's advancement some other way um but we we still need to iron out those details for sure um but it's that's certainly the the trickiest part i think uh, that i've encountered during the season 
I'm sure. And there was always talk of, oh, hockey should do a bubble. Uh, and that was unrealistic for, you know, whatever reasons. But uh, is there a way that you could end up doing a bubble for the playoffs? If it's just a two week stretch where you need all the teams available, you know, we say, okay, well, let's just have everybody be in either, well, it's one campus or their own localized bubbles on their own campus. Is that possible? Yeah. So I think you, you look at like what the NCHC did and they achieved that. Uh, that was an incredible task. Uh, absolutely unbelievable job to get that done by them uh, because they had the infrastructure, they had the resources to do it. You know, is there somewhere like that in the Northeast? Probably not. Um, at the same time, we feel pretty confident in how we've been able to execute our games when it comes to the games and playing and, and getting our teams in and out. Um, so you know, is, is it going to be a, a bubble where we're in Manchester or something for, you know, a week? Uh, probably not. Manchester just turned down, you know, the regionals. So uh, I think that kind of gives you an indication of, of what those level arenas are thinking uh, for that time frame. So if we're able to continue with the success that we've had with playing the actual games, uh, and for the most part, pretty much every team has been very good at, at, at sticking to the protocols. And, and when something pops up, they go into the protocol uh, regardless of whether or not the games are played, that's, that's secondary at that point. But, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to be, you know, staying uh, more towards a continuation of what we've been doing during the regular season. And, um, if that's how we get the games in, that's how we get the games. in. I think at this point, we feel that's probably our best bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to really put, probably put something to bed, just to make sure the listeners know it probably, um, I would assume going to the TD garden for the semifinals and finals is off the table for this year. So that is not officially off the table yet. Oh, um, hello. But do I think, do, do I think it's likely? No. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's going to be one of those things where uh, we want to be in control of everything. Right. Uh, and we can do that by playing on our campuses. Um, our campuses have done it before. Uh, we're not opening up a building that hasn't been open for, you know, a, an event of our size. Um, you know, there was some talk, I think, back in the beginning when uh, Marty Walsh might have said something about um, having 75,000 fans, 7,500 fans in, in TD Garden um, or, or the Bruins playing at Fenway, something like that. Uh, so those are fun conversations to have. Um, but just logistically, as we're looking through it, uh, it, it's most likely just a, a campus event because we've done it and because our campuses are, you know, some of the, the better facilities in the Northeast anyway uh, that can produce a television pro uh, production, um, you know, just as good as anybody else. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where that would feel bad, I think, for the players um, because we like it being an event, especially including on the women's side when we, when we make it a destination event. Um, but at the end of the day, if we give out the trophies, that's what we want to do. We want someone to win the trophies um, and, and we'll feel good about that. Yeah. So you're telling me hockey's playoffs aren't coming to Fenway Park. I, 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 I tried I tried I tried my best um but I don't think we're playing at Fenway this year <laughs> mm, shame. Patrick that's all I have uh, if you had anything else yeah well aside from uh making my heart hurt about the end of frozen Fenway or it feels like the end of frozen Fenway it's been oh, a few whoa, years whoa. well it feels it's been a few years but um I guess speaking of the garden um you know, when Harvard called it quits on the season was that kind of the end of any hope at all for bean pot or was there any I don't know how much I, it's obviously it's a separate entity, but so don't know how much conversation you guys have there. Yeah. Uh, so for frozen Fenway, I'm sure we'll be back at some point. Um, okay. we, we had a date, we had a date penciled in and then things out of our control, not COVID related, believe it or not, Whoa. uh, happened where we, we just couldn't make it work. Um, but frozen Fenway will be back. They own the rink in some form. Uh, the, the Worcester rink is out there and, uh, Joe Britannia stayed on as an advisor, uh, and he, he is very close with Sam Kennedy. So there will be outdoor hockey somewhere in a baseball field uh, soon. Incredible. Um, yeah. Report so, so I mean, Frozen Fenway's yeah. death have been greatly exaggerated. Yes, yes. So don't don't cry for Frozen Fenway. Uh, like, we will be back. Because I had the um, idea of popping in my head, you know, like even if it's not Fenway, I know Nickerson Field at BU isn't the biggest capacity, but, you know, there's alumni field. UConn has the big field. So, but. Nice, yeah, to, nice to see there is still hope. Yeah, yeah. The rink, the rink is owned. So, you know, if we don't use it, it's it's just taking up space. Um, so that will be back. Uh, in terms of the bean pot, uh, essentially, yes. When when Harvard, you know, tapped out, the bean pot isn't a hockey east production, um, as not enough people know. I think uh, yeah. Harvard's not in hockey east. 
So it, the event itself is um, organized by the TD Garden, um, by the four individual schools. So they're the stakeholders. Uh, we, we, we are obviously aware of what's happening and then give advice and, and tournament direct and things like that when it has to, especially on the women's side. Um, but yeah, when Harvard backed out, that was uh, in effect the end of that uh, as they're you know, one fifth of the, the ownership of, of what the actual tournament is mm -hmm. and not having it in the garden um that's the bean pot the garden that's that is what it is and i think if you uh, you guys might be too young to remember this but um six seven years ago maybe when uh, before the friendship four began uh marty walsh again uh <laughs> two marty walsh mentions today um he had mentioned something in the newspaper about bringing the uh bean pot to belfast northern ireland as part of the city sister agreement at boston and, and belfast um, and that wasn't going to happen because the bean pop is Boston. Uh, but it was the genesis of the creation of the friendship Four. so they call their trophy, the bell pot trophy. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's a bell and they ring it. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, but so the, the bean pot is, is just a, a part of the fabric. I think of the city of, of the, of the TD garden. So when Harvard backed out, they're really, you know, replacing them wasn't really much of an option, I think at, at that point. So, uh, I think Steve actually Metcalf might've been the, the one that said it out loud first that it wasn't going to happen. Um, but you know, we, we kind of saw that coming when, when Harvard backed out, which is unfortunate, but, um, understandable in, in, in this season for sure. Yeah. It, it makes your February a little bit easier if nothing else. <laughs> I, I will <laughs> agree with that. Yeah. You know, uh, I was talking to Bernie Corbett on Monday and he said, Hey, you know, it's the bean pot Monday and there's 12 inches of snow on the way. It's that's how it normally is. Um, yeah. so at the very least in 15, uh, the Jack Eichel year, the bean pot, we, when it got delayed, um, it snowed like two feet every Monday. Yeah. And I sat on the lever connector before the first bean pot games, uh, for two hours. And I, I was ready to jump off of it because I, I couldn't I couldn't sit in my car anymore, um, not moving. And and that is something that I don't miss. Uh, I didn't want to drive in in the snow, um, but yeah, it made it makes my my first two Mondays in February a little bit easier. Uh, and I, I need all the extra time I can get at this point. And I'm just happy we worked uh, we worked a uh, Belfast reference into this. The French yeah, Bel Paul Patrick. <laughs> yes yes the that, i'm not gonna do the so, pretend irish accent that's right um cool i think that's all for me oh other than uh in brian's twitter bio m&m aficionado i need to know your favorite one um yeah give oh me we a have it oh my god okay where, where are we going this is an elite background by the way like this is this is a guy caramel caramel m &Ms. oh i got excited I thought those were the pretzel m &Ms. Yeah, don't don't go anywhere too far without caramel M&Ms. Um, okay. But peanut, peanut M&Ms are the usual go-to. Uh, but yeah, caramel M&Ms are, are the way to go. Wow. Are wow. you partial towards a particular color of m and I, I don't care what color it is. As long as it tastes like an m and I'll eat it. Uh, okay. it's, it's a serious issue, uh, which I realized I had in college when my mother brought me a five-pound bag of peanut M&Ms, and I ate it in one weekend. Ooh. and uh you never stopped no. yeah i know like i never stopped. sour patch kids i was there was oh, there was a period of time where i, I physically uh thought i was addicted to m&ms because of that instance but i think we're far away i have never sour five. patch m&ms also over there sour patch m&ms <laughs> yeah wow yeah no see i got my like, skittles over here the sour the, patch they're yeah they're like sour skittles like, yeah yeah i am afraid of anything sour patch that's not just like the kids um now after having about the watermelons chips, the, yeah, the watermelons, are, the watermelons way to go. are great oh the strawberry ones are great have you had those i Ooh, haven't had strawberry ones, ones no Ooh, those might be the best ones see some <laughs> people have their m&ms brady has his sour patch kids and his stadium popcorn stadium popcorn can't go wrong that's one thing i miss you know going to games at a and you just get a bucket of popcorn like you can't beat that but we'll be back soon enough right hopefully anyway mm -hmm. all right well, I think that's all I got, Brady. That's all from me. I appreciate it with Brian here for yeah, just so about much. an hour now. Yeah, no problem, guys. I, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, hopefully that was somewhat informative. Uh, I, I oh, feel extremely. like I, I gave you – that's that's been my day, my, my whole week, um, you know, for the last several months. So uh, if you got anything out of that, that, that makes me feel better. Definitely did.
and I'll, I'll continue with my, you know, Twitter. Yeah, no, keep it going. Cause it's, it's honestly, it's great to see, um, you know, and, and there might be something that I rip off at some point. There's, there's probably usually a better way to do things than the way that I do them. So, uh, yeah, I encourage you to keep it going. It's, it's been fun to watch. Thank you. Enjoy it. All right, Patrick, take it home. Well, so we got BU hockey this weekend as I was almost duped on Twitter, at least on the women's <laughs> side. Um, so BU women Friday afternoon, three 30 at Walter Brown against Merrimack BU men, the battle of Comav take two is back. Uh, they got home and home with BC seven o'clock at Connie on Friday and seven o'clock at Walter Brown on Saturday. But as always, you can find me on Twitter at Pat Don 12 Brady's on Twitter at Brady D Gardner. Brian is on Twitter at, uh, I was about to say Brian Smith. It's not the full Smith B R I S M I H E all caps on Twitter. That's Brian on Twitter. And I promise you, if you Google WTBU sports, you will find the website, but I'm going to try and do the URL here. Oh boy. Sites.bu.edu slash WTBU slash sports. I almost, I almost always do slash radio, but it's not. So just slash sports. I promise you it's all there. Um, and WTBU sports on Twitter at WTBU sports, of course. But again, thank you so much to Brian for joining us. And thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.